Thank you, John, and thank you, Jerron, and everyone for sharing your talents with us today that God has so freely given to all of us. My name is Danny Tuye. My pronouns are he, him. My partner is Keith Walker. His pronouns are he, him. We are members of St. Elmo United Methodist Church, and I am so humbled that you allowed me to come worship with you. So thank you for sharing God's grace with me. The first sermon I ever preached I was five years old. The congregation looked a lot different. Eight stuffed animals and one G.I. Joe. Today's message is titled, Just a Nobody. Have you ever felt like a nobody? Maybe you're too young. Maybe you're too old. Maybe you're in the place in life that you had hoped you would be. Maybe you're in a place in life that you wish you were better off at. Maybe you hear voices saying that you're a nobody. When I first moved to Tennessee, I'm from originally from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I moved to Bradley County, to Cleveland. Beautiful area, lovely people. But I was quite shocked because my co-workers were actually talking which county had the most nobodies in it. They mentioned Meigs County, Ray County, Polk County, and I was scratching my head saying, I've been to Polk County. When I go to the Okoye River and I see the Appalachian Mountains, I can't help but think of what the psalmist wrote. For I looked into the mountains from whence cometh my salvation. And then Ray County, that's where Keith lived in Dayton, on Ray County. And each year they have a strawberry festival. It is Americana. I mean, if you want to step back 40, 60, 70, 80 years ago and see what a community event is like, go to the Strawberry Festival in Dayton. It's a lot of fun. Ray County is where we had our families. We would celebrate with our friends. And people in Ray County, they would hug us. And they would claim us as one of our own. But where I just moved to called them nobodies. Who are the nobodies? You know, when you move to a new area... There's a certain question people ask. When I first moved to Connecticut, it was Essex, Connecticut. It was founded, Essex was founded in about 1630, 1640. So people have been there a long, long time. And people would say, now Danny, what port in the U.S. did your family arrive? And I'm thinking, oh my, about to get judged. Here we go. <laughs> In Tennessee, especially Chattanooga, we have that same kind of question. When you're a new person, people say, what school did you attend? I was talking to my friend Renee, Renee McLaughlin, and she said, Danny, that happens to me all the time in Chattanooga. She, people will come up and say, well, Dr. McLaughlin, what school did you attend? And she would say, well, I attended the School of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Oh, no, honey, what high school? Did you attend? It's a common question. Did you go to a, high, to a school of the high, upper echelons? Or were you like me who went to a public school in Baton Rouge, actually a bad part of town in Baton Rouge, that if you went there, people thought you were a nobody? Often I struggle with being a nobody. And when God calls me to get out of that boat, and I look at my spiritual tool shed, and I don't have that tool. And I say, God, how am I going to do this? That's when I hear God talking to me. Saying, Danny boy, look at all the nobodies in Scripture I've used. Look at all the nobodies I'm using today. So if you're willing and able, we're going to we're gonna read about a nobody in Scripture so please stand up for the reading from the Gospel of John, starting in chapter 4. Jesus had to go through Samaria. He came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, which was near the land Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down at the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. 
His disciples had gone into the city to buy him some food. The Samaritan woman asked, Why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jesus responded, If you recognize God's gift and who is saying to you, Give me some water to drink, you would be asking him and he would give you living water. The woman said, Sir, you don't have a bucket, and the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave this well to us, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in those who drink it a spring of water that bubbles up in eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, get your husband and come back here. The woman cried, I have no husband. You are right to say, I don't have a husband, Jesus answered. You've had five husbands and the man you are with now isn't your husband. You've spoken the truth. The woman said, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it's necessary to worship in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people worship what you don't know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But the time is coming. And it is here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. The Father looks for those who worship him this way. God is spirit, and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will teach us everything. Jesus said to her, I am the one who speaks with you. Just then, Jesus' disciples arrived and were shocked that he was talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? The woman put down her water and went to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who has told me everything I've done. Could this be the Christ? They left the city, and they were on their way to see Jesus. Many Samaritans in that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's word when she testified. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many believe because of his word, and they said to the woman, We no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is truly the Savior of the world. A word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. This woman has three strikes against her. First, she's a woman living in a patriarchal society. Second, she's a Samaritan. Jews consider Samaritans as impure because Samaritans would interwed with the Gentiles, and not just Gentiles, but with pagans. Her third strike is her reputation. In this passage, she had had five husbands, and the, woman, the person she's living with now, he is not her husband. The passage begins that Jesus stops at the well, he's thirsty, it's noontime. And the woman at the well, she's there. As many of us know, between 12 and 4 is the hottest part of the day. Most people, when they go draw their water, they go, go in the early morning, or at dusk, they go in the cool of the day. Most people don't get their water in the heat of the day. So I'm wondering why this woman goes when no one else is there. Is she tired of the gossip? People whispering about her sullied reputation? Does she get tired of the looks she receives? What I love about her is her audacity. Even though she has all these strikes going against her, she questions God. She accepts Christ. What's amazing, she is the woman with all these strikes, is the first recorded evangelist in the, in the Gospel of John, is a nobody. 
Folks, we're going to hear a song called Just a Nobody. And if you hear nothing else from this message, please pay attention to the lyrics of this song. It encapsulates God's message has for you. Why you ever chose me has always been a mystery. All my life I've been told I belong at the end of the line with all the other not quite, with all the other getting right. But it turns out they're the ones you were looking for all this time. Cause I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody All about somebody Who saved my soul Ever since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Moses had stage fright And David brought a rock to a sword fight You picked twelve outsiders Nobody would have chosen And you changed the world Well, the moral of the story is Everybody's got a purpose So when I hear the devil start talking to me Saying, who do you think you are? I say I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody All about somebody Who saved my soul Ever since you rescued me you gave my heart a song to sing I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus So let me go down, down, down In history as another blood-bought faithful member of the family And if they all forget my name Well, that's fine with me I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus So let me go down, down, down In history as another blood-bought faithful member of the family And if they all forget my name Well, that's fine with me I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul ever since you rescued me you gave my heart a song to sing I'm living for the world to see nobody but Jesus I'm living for the world to see nobody but Jesus I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Amen. God's message and a beautiful song. Just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who saved your soul. Think about the nobodies. Think about little boy David. Remember little boy David? Samuel said, Samuel, go to Bethlehem and go to Jesse's house because God's going to be anoint, anointing one of his sons. 
And so Samuel goes all the way to Bethlehem. And this is how I like to picture it. Samuel goes to the house, and you can hear. And Jesse opens the door, and Samuel says, Jesse, bring out your boys, because God's going to be anointing one of them. And Jesse's probably thinking, wow, the prophet Samuel. So he brings out his sons, and can't you imagine? They're probably tall, muscular, look kingly. They look like somebody. So Samuel goes to the first one, the oldest, and he's about to anoint him, and God says, no, no, not him. So he goes to the second one and says, no, no, not him. Samuel goes through all the sons, and God keeps on saying, no, no, not him. And after the last one, Samuel scratches his head saying, I've come all the way to Bethlehem to anoint one of Jesse's boys, and no one's here. So he says, Jesse, don't you have one more? Don't you have one more son? Jesse said, well, I've got one. He's the runt of the pack. The only good thing he's good for is watching sheep and writing hymns and psalms and playing the harp. Samuel says, bring him in here. And when David enters the house, God says, he's the one. He's the one to be anointed. And then we think about the disciples. You know, growing up in the church, we think of the disciples, the apostles, as way up here. And then we begin studying, learning who they are, and they're people. They're common people. They're people just like us. Most of them are fishermen. There's two I really do like. I really, Matthew, the tax collector. Of course, I'm an accountant, so I have a soft spot for the tax collector. But Matthew is a Jew. He's taken money from his fellow Jews to support a foreign government. Don't you know his neighbors do not like that? They would consider him a traitor. And then on the opposite end of the political spectrum, you have Simon the Zealot. Simon is called a zealot because he wants nothing to do with Rome. He wants to kick Rome out. Have you ever thought what it was like to sit at the same table, break bread with these two? God called them to put away their differences and come into unity and share in ministry with one another. And then we think about faults. You know, little boy David, who is now king, he had faults. He had a lot of faults. And probably one of the first thoughts you're thinking of is Bathsheba. How David took another man's wife to be his own. The one I go back to is Absalom. David had a son named Absalom. David didn't mess up just once. He messed up multiple times. But Scripture says that David was a man after his own heart, even though he messed up. And so David messes up, and his son Absalom says, Dad, you messed up. This wasn't just an argument. This became a struggle. So much so that Absalom had an army, David had an army. The two armies come together, and Absalom's killed. David realizes that he is responsible for his son's death. Can you hear David in the early morning hours in the palace? Crying out, Absalom, Absalom. He made a mistake. You ever make a mistake? Do you ever cry out in the early morning hours, Absalom, Absalom? And then we think of Peter. Peter made mistakes, right? Peter is a Greek word meaning rock. You know, the New Testament's in Greek, but it's not the language spoken by Jesus and his disciples. They, they spoke Aramaic, and Jesus said, I'm going to call you Cephas. Cephas is an Aramaic word for rock. Just like in Greek, Peter is rock. So if you hear me say Peter or Cephas, just know the important part is that I'm saying the word rock. And you remember when the disciples are on the boat on the Sea of Galilee and a storm comes up and they see Jesus walking on the water? A lot of us say, oh, there's Peter again. He's going to mess up again. I consider this a victory because Peter gets out of his comfort zone in the middle of the storm to walk on water. He fails. But isn't the victory of him getting out of the boat? Is God calling you to get out of your comfort zone? to get out of the boat. And then we see the crucifixion. 
where Peter, during this time, this saintly man, this rock, he denies Jesus three times. Our Jesus, he denies. Three times he denies him. Jesus dies, but he doesn't ascend to heaven right away. Right? He, Jesus stays with us for a few more days. During this time, the disciples on the uh, Lake of Tiberias, it's also known as the Sea of Galilee, and they've been fishing all night long. They've been fishing, and they haven't caught anything. And they hear a man on the shore, and the man says, Hey, how much you caught? And they said, Well, we haven't caught anything. This man says, Well, get your nets and throw them on the other side of the boat. And they pull up their nets, and they do what the man says, and they've got a bounty of fish. When they come to shore, they notice this man is Jesus. And he's fixing them breakfast. He's got bread there, too. I like to contextualize a story, or let, let's put ourselves in it. Who enjoys fishing? No, no. Who enjoys eating? <laughs> Who enjoys going to a campfire and sitting around it with your friends? Don't you just love those moments? You can smell the fish cooking in the frying pan, that skillet. It's morning time, so the day's getting a little warmer. The sun's coming up. You see the glorious morning colors in the sky. And as you look across the lake, you can see dragonflies just skimming. It's a day, kind of the day, when everything is really, really quiet. And everything's really, really loud. There is a symphony of bullfrogs and crickets. When you're sitting around a campfire and your friends are whispering, you can hear every word they say. This is the moment they were in. Breaking bread, eating fish, sharing and laughing with one another. And Jesus says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Jesus says, then take care of my sheep. People are eating their breakfast and enjoying one another's company. And the third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter realizes this is the third time. Jesus has asked him the same question. Peter's probably thinking, Jesus is just trying to tell me something. He's calling me into something. But he's also realizing this is the third time Jesus has asked me. And he's recognizing the significance of that number. Because it wasn't long ago, just a few days ago, where Peter, this rock, denied Jesus three times. Peter's probably quite humbled and thinking, how can somebody like me, a nobody, who keeps on messing up with all these faults, how can I keep on being called into ministry? Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Church, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Sisters, brothers, siblings of God, do we love Jesus? Then feed his sheep. Amen.